Hi, everybody, and welcome to a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing tonight? Um, I'm actually feeling incredibly exhausted. And, Same. And, you know, the, funny, the weird thing is, like, so... Back before COVID, I, my favorite thing in the world to do was actually to watch movies. I had mm-hmm. the Regal subscription. I was one of those early adopters of MoviePass. Yeah. Um, I had Cinemia when it was around for like 14 minutes before they went bankrupt too. Yeah. I just really miss movies. And yeah. It, it's actually not even a segue into because we're talking about movies today. But yeah. I just miss movies. <laughs> I do too. I love movies. Movies are, are my favorite thing. That's why I love pop culture so much is because there's so much you can get from movies. There's so many different narratives to be explored. And cinema, honestly over time has just become one of my biggest passions when it comes to not even just like LGBT cinema, but to uh, pop culture and cinema in general. Um, I love just exploring different types of movies, whether it's uh, some more independent artsy cinema or something that is a bit more mainstream. Yeah, and it's, for me, I like to lose myself. Like people always say I have a bad taste in movies. I actually just like movies. Like if I'm just decently entertained, like good. Like, am I going to be like, oh my god, it's my favorite? No. That's where we differ. I will not sit through a movie I don't like. (laughs) That's why I have such a hard time finding a movie that I like on Netflix. Like, I will not watch the full thing. I'll, like, sit and I'll watch, like, the second I don't like something in it, I'll be like, nope, next. Well, and actually, that's the funny thing about me in the Netflix movies is that I takes me so long to choose one uh-huh. because I have to suffer through the whole thing. Yeah. If it's bad. Yeah. So I'm yeah. just like, I'm like, okay, this one has great reviews. It looks good. The cover's yeah. great. The description's fine. The only time I'll watch a full bad movie is if I'm watching with a group of people. Yeah. Because if- I'm not that asshole that's going to be like, turn it off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so fantastic. Um, so this, so the next few episodes, and we have some bonus episodes in there for you guys, we're going to be talking about pop culture, LGBTQ plus community stuff. So like queer representation in movies and TV shows and magazines and like all this other stuff. Yes, other forms of media. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just like, you know, like doing anything. Um, <laughs> all that fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so we're doing, uh, so we're starting with movies, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, it kind of came up in our last episode. Um, or something we were talking about. I'm not quite sure. I don't know if it was our last episode, but it's definitely come up in our talks. Like, right. what movies, queer movies specifically, have impacted us the most over time. Do you remember your first, like, queer movie experience? I don't, actually. I was telling Donna right before we started filming that um, I don't really... Because, you know, there's the queer movie experience when you kind of know you're a little queer. Uh-huh. And then, like, it's kind of like, oh, my God, like, yeah. the representation. And then there's the first gay, like, person Characters. you saw. Like, mm-hmm. gay character you saw in a movie and I'm struggling to actually figure it out and I I think it's because the character was probably so overly flamboyant Mm -hmm. that it just like faded into the background like okay so it was either that or you had to rely on sub subtext to see yeah. if the character was gay or lesbian or, or you know, identified as queer in some sort of way. So yeah. it, was, it was either very hidden by subtext or it was, like, very out loud and flamboyant. My first experience in seeing gay characters on TV was through the movie Mrs. Doubtfire with the gay uncles. Oh my gosh, drag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it was drag. It was my first taste of drag as well. So it was, you know, Robin Williams getting all done up as an old woman so he could have that time with his kids and watch them. Um, and it was his gay brother and his partner that put him up into the full prosthesis of becoming that old woman. You know, and the funny thing is that probably actually was mine because I remember, because as you're talking about it, I remember sitting at my grandmother's house watching Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah. Um, when it finally came to TV and I remember being so confused about why they were all, because all three of them were being incredibly flamboyant during yeah. the wig and makeup scenes. Yeah. And I was so confused about why they were acting that way. I, I didn't understand either, and it wasn't until, I think, later on when I was watching it as I was getting older that he makes reference to, like, he says, like, Aunt Frank or something like that while, while they're, you know, because you know how oh, we are. Yeah. yeah. He, he says something like that when he's ta- talking to his kids about how he got done up. And so he references the gay uncle's and then then I realized later on, I was like, oh, so they were, they were mar- you know, partnered. Um, oh, that makes more sense yeah. now. And I believe the movie took place in San Francisco, so that makes sense. Oh, yeah, definitely does. <laughs> it definitely does. So we wanted to have a quick stepping off point, because there are a lot of movies out there. Like, we're not going to go through every single movie and talk about it in that way, but there were a bunch of queer movies that we just expect that you all have probably seen at this point. Mm-hmm. And actually, knowing that my mom listens to this, she's not seen any of these that I'm going to say. But... <laughs> 
But they're also suggestions. They're also wanna, suggestions. Yeah. yeah, just if you want to get that taste of queer culture. Um, and it's funny. We actually wrote this down in a really funny way. But we were to, we want to talk about uh, the adventures of Priscilla Queen of the Desert in 1994. Yes. <laughs> um, we also want to talk about Tu Wong Fu um, as one of the iconic drag films of the 90s and The Birdcage. Um, so it's really strange that these three really prominent drag movies came out all three years in the, you know in succession of one another yeah it was 94 95 and 96 yeah which is and kind of crazy and listeners just really quick before we go on any further i want you to know that a spoiler alert is in effect as we are talking about movies so if if there's something we're not going to try we're not going to reveal plot points we're going to try to just summarize and talk about some themes of the movies rather than like what it's about but um spoiler alert just in case you don't want to know what they're about yeah so definitely because i'll know. definitely forget to say that later yeah but yeah, so three very prominent drag movies all came out in the mid '90s, um, around the time, um, in, in the same time period as one another, um, and they were all extremely iconic in their own way. They were. They so for me. So I saw Priscilla Queen of the Desert uh, recently, actually, probably within the last four years. Mm-hmm. That's the first time I saw it, and I thought that the the drag from the. By the way, the name Priscilla Queen of the Desert is a terrible name for what that movie yeah. is about. Um, it's, because the I, full name is The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which I didn't even fully realize till we were writing the n- names down of the movies. Yeah, actually, it would have made more sense because isn't the main queen's name Priscilla? Or something no, like no, that? the bus. The bus is named Priscilla. Yes, the bus That's is right. the queen of the desert. Yeah, yeah. With the bus with the shoe on top of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually just, it's, it's a really great, interesting movie about drag queens traveling. Yeah. Oh, most of these are about drag queens traveling. Um, <laughs> drag queens want to go places, I guess. Yeah, it's about yeah drag queens traveling and just kind of actually, you know, as we travel, we always say that we want to have like those two Wong Fu type of moments. Yes. You know, like and we've we've had a lot of instances where we've got to travel across so the U.S. close to the and two. and have have things like that. Not necessarily traveling like in drag all the time. Yeah, because that's a horrible experience. Sitting but, down in a car for that long in drag is not fun. No, it's not. And actually. Tu Wong Fu, uh, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar, mm-hmm. is, uh, it's about three drag queens. RuPaul's in it, by the way. It's a, um, it's a movie about RuPaul three... and Coco Peru. And Coco Peru is mm-hmm. in there, yeah. Traveling across, um, to go to this, like, competition or whatever, and yeah. that's what it's about. And it's just their misadventures along the way. Yeah. Um, that's actually the first time that I heard the original Wonder Woman theme song, was when they're decorating the room. Yeah. Tu Wong Fu. Oh, they really? Get to, yeah, that's the first time I heard of that song. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I need to watch yeah, that. I would say Tu Wong Fu out of the three that we just named. So, uh, The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert was in 94. Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar was in 95. And then The Birdcage was in 1996. I'd say Tu Wong Fu is probably the most iconic out of those three yeah. drag movies. It's, it's definitely, as a drag queen, it's like one of the staples you have to see. It is. It yeah. is. What is the. So, I've seen The Birdcage like halfway through. Um, what is the birdcage about exactly? So the birdcage is about basically there's these uh, two gay dads that have this son. He's getting married to this girl. Oh, okay. um, this girl's family uh, comes from a conservative um, senator, I believe, either a senator or a house oh, representative. That um, yeah. So she comes from a very conservative family that's in Washington, and she has these two gay dads in Florida that own a uh, club called the Birdcage, and it's a drag club. Okay. So, um, and one of his stepdads is one of the main performers, is is the main performer of that drag club. Uh, So they're stuck in this predicament now where they have to play straight in front of uh, the conservative uh, father and mother-in-law. That's actually really interesting. Yeah. That's like, it's funny talking about all of that, because I, like, it matches to a bunch of different movies that we want to talk about today too Mm -hmm. and kind of the themes that are coming from them so you have to remember like we're talking about so i was born in 80 something and (laughs) and you have to just remember that when some of these came out obviously um it wasn't that i was ever restricted from watching movies we were also just kind of poor yeah Um, so i never saw movies in theaters i only saw them my dad loved to um my dad was that guy that would go to the VHS store and he would rent something. Then he'd take it home and record it on the secondary VCR. Oh, and yeah. so we had a huge movie collection of just movies that my dad stole. And I didn't actually realize <laughs> that movies only had one movies on the VHS day. Yeah. Because all of the movies we had always had three or four movies. Oh, on the VHS wow. Day. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm just learning these things about my childhood. So my dad is a criminal. Um, <laughs> that's, wow. 
<laughs> I just realized that. That was me growing up. We never had... I didn't know that Disney movies came in those puffy VHF sticks. It was... And the Nickelodeon movies, too, yeah. Oh, I, mm-hmm. because all of mine were just black VHS tapes with nobody <laughs> writing on them. What's it? No. Oh, good heavens. Sorry, everybody. I'm just having... I'm unpacking things. Um, so, moving along. <laughs> so, I, we did want to touch real briefly on Brokeback Mountain and Love, Simon. Yeah, some of the more mainstream movies um, that are fairly recent. Brokeback Mountain came out in 2005 um, and really is a tragedy. Um, yeah, it's a really horrific... Uh, sorry, it's not a horrific film. It's just a really heartbreaking film. It's very heartbreaking. It uh, It talks about the tragedy of being basically a Wyom- a closeted Wyoming cowboy mm-hmm. being stuck in a essentially loveless marriage and, and being in love with, you know, someone else who happens to be of the same sex. And in, in that time, that was extremely, extremely taboo. This is, again, mm-hmm. before marriage equality. I mean, 2005 even is, is before we had a lot of the rights that we have today. And it's really crazy to think that, you know, our, our history and a lot of the progress that we have has happened in such a short time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I um so when when you first saw Brokeback Mountain, um I saw it as a as a kid. I think transitioning from middle school to high school, so I was in puberty when Brokeback Mountain came out. I had to watch it in secret on uh, our Stars on Demand account, and then delete the history after I I watched it. So for me, because obviously I'm a <clears throat> in college when this movie comes out, <laughs> and um, <laughs> so um. I wanted to say, so, like, I used to see movies constantly in high school and Mm -hmm. same in college. So, regardless of how I'm dating myself for this movie, this movie actually didn't release in all major theaters. No. You had to go find this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, it was really hard. And there was, like, there was a few independent theaters in Denver that showed it. So, we, like, did a trip with me and my friends, and that's how we actually went to see it. Um... And I have one comment that I want to make about Brokeback Mountain that's really interesting, because this is 2005, and at this time I am still a virgin, actually, in 2005. And the one thing I want to say, so, Mom, close your ears, and hashtag it's rated R, they made queer sex look very easy in that movie. It's not. No, and it it doesn't happen in a tent in the middle of the wilderness with no preparation and no lube. Uh, yeah, seriously. With nothing but spit, you with, know? I, it's funny, as an adult, I went and rewatched that scene again. I was like, oh, this is fake. Yeah. There's no way that no. was gonna happen. At that point, they were backed up from, from days of camping. That would not, that would have been a very, uh, let's just say it wouldn't have been as clean as they made it seem, okay? Yeah, seriously. That was not a beautiful experience. Experience to, no. Like, that was a lie. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I think the important thing to explore in this movie is, like, the... the It ends in tragedy. It ends right. it ends in sadness, and it ends um, telling the story of two people that couldn't fully express themselves. And during right. that time, that was very... It was a very prominent theme, because a lot of um, gay people still were having to be forced in the closet for multiple reasons, because of the fact that we simply don't have the rights that we have today. Yeah. And that's why it's interesting. It's an interesting dichotomy between Love, Simon, which came out in 2018. Yes. Because this film, they even said in the film, like, you know, coming out in high school nowadays isn't as hard as it Mm -hmm. was even five years ago. Still hard, still learning yourself and things like that. And the movie is about a kid who kind of fully knows Mm -hmm. like and he's just trying to figure out how he wants to come out of the closet and he goes through a bad experience where people force him out of the closet Mm -hmm. um and he literally just said he's like i wanted to be able to do it on my terms which was such an eye-opening experience but the one thing that i want to bring up about this is like this movie isn't a tragedy it's like celebrating gay stories even though it's coming of age yeah um and he has this really powerful scene with his mom where she basically knows something's wrong And Mm -hmm. she just admits it to him. She's just like, yeah. She's like, I was just waiting for you to talk to me. And then the scene he has with his dad is so very classic dad. His dad's like, yeah, we both like baseball and it's cool you're gay. Pretty much is how the scene in my my brain plays out. It wasn't necessarily like, I was just waiting for you to talk to me. It was a bit more emotional than that. She was like, she's like, after you came out, it felt like you had a weight off of you. It felt like you could breathe. And yeah. as a mom recogn- recognizing that, it was it was a very emotional scene, you know? It was. And it, 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 it really, I think, still, even though Love, Simon, I don't think it fully romanticizes the gay experience, but it definitely, it, it, it showed how things have changed over time. 
for right. kids coming out and because it definitely wasn't the case for my high school experience and I also have to watching Love Simon realize that I have to separate that because it is in another generation it is you it know is definitely in another generation yeah um because it's yeah so we don't I don't want to necessarily spend too much time on Love Simon because like it's very popular most of the people who've are listening mm-hmm. and probably seen it. Um, we all probably felt all those same feels. But it's kind of cool that, you know, some of these queer movies are actually finally becoming mainstream. Yeah. Um, and kind of with that conversation, I wanted to take this time to kind of say, the fact is, like, it's just really becoming to one of those points to where we really do want to have representation of queer stories that are not specifically just coming of age. Mm-hmm. I actually didn't want to see Love, Simon when it first came out because I just was like, another coming of age gay story like there are so many other queer stories that we can tell it doesn't have to just be our struggle of coming out yeah (laughs) exactly exactly so um i haven't i didn't ask this earlier i don't know i just keep forgetting every episode um but donna how are you doing this evening um you know what i'll let you know after this brief commercial break Get ready for the digital drag experience you've been waiting for. Introvert, an online interactive drag experience. The show is Saturday, August 1st at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time with queens from franchise like Camp Wanakiki, RuPaul's Drag Race, and the Boulay Brothers Dragula. The show's hosted by Autumn Rains Hart and Camp Wanakiki Season 2 star Coco Gem Holiday. Tickets are available for $5 at thecdsdrag.com slash introvert. It's a podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Tune into what they tell you podcast with Coco and Donna tell a podcast. Well, Coco, I am feeling great and ready to celebrate queer cinema. We're going to be talking a little bit more about some of the mainstream flicks uh, from the 2000s uh, and Speaking of of coming-of-age stories, as we were in the first part of the episode, Moonlight was one that was extremely, extremely popular and hit the mainstream back in 2018. Yeah, I think me and Donna saw that. We did. We saw that together. I I think it was just us, actually. Yeah. Um, Small joke. Moonlight feels like I was edging the entire time. Yes. I just remember being moving, leaving the theater so sexually frustrated. And just to ruin this, because once again, we're going to do a trigger warning, because <laughs> um, we are going to talk about some of the spoiler deaths. Spoiler alert movie. is Spo- in effect. Oh, yeah. Spoil- I said trigger warning. <laughs> spoiler alert. And I guess trigger warning for any of the straight people listening. <laughs> um, no. So, like, there's actually not a sex scene in the movie. There's not. They're there all... is kind of one. There's um, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, like, one of the boys gives the other boy, like, a hand job. I don't the think beach. there's actually even a kiss, is there? Um... No, and at the end of the movie, you just, you're wanting the kiss so bad. Yeah. And it doesn't come. Instead, they just kind of hold each other, then the movie ends. Yeah. I'm just, I know that it won every award in the God Dang Sun, but good God, that was a really intense journey without any climax. It was. <laughs> with that. And a, the thing I, I loved Moonlight, and the, I mean, it won, it won the best picture for a reason, you know? It did. Yeah. Um, because it told a story that has not really, it has not been told in the mainstream on cinema. Yeah, poor black kids who are mm-hmm. queer, like, that's just not a thing. Yeah, and, and existing in very, very hyper-masculine hyper societies, you know, mm-hmm. and the fact that the main character, Chiron, had this male figure that um, accepted him mm-hmm. as he was and um, didn't villainize him for being queer but also didn't necessarily celebrate it either you know we didn't really see that so much so the celebration of him being queer but also just the celebration of him you know coming into his adulthood and all that you know um it it was a very unique perspective and i think that's why the movie did so well is because it it definitely showed a unique uh queer perspective well and and because black stories along with queer stories are not told so when you combine those things because what was it up against that year it was that la la land la la land yeah yeah and it and in my personal opinion i love both films but moonlight was amazing yeah. compared to that. Yeah. Because these stories, like, we're, the fact of the matter is, too, when it comes to the way that they told this story, is they didn't shy away from the hard subjects on either end. Mm-hmm. They didn't shy away from the queer stuff. They didn't shy away from the black issues of being poor and, like, having to, you know, navigate these circumstances. So... Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Normal Heart was another mainstream movie that really struck some chords. 
Um, it was about the AIDS crisis. And actually, The Normal Heart, the first I heard of The Normal Heart, it was it was a, a play on, on Broadway. Um, and Ellen Barkin was the role of the doctor in that play. And then when I saw they were HBO was making it into a movie and Julia Roberts would be playing the role of the doctor, I was really mm-hmm. excited to see how it would turn out, and I was not disappointed. It was a star-studded cast, mm-hmm. extremely emotional. It gripped me in a lot of ways. Well, and for me, too, just to make sure I'm staying on theme with saying really things that are inappropriate about sex, <laughs> uh, this movie had a scene, the powerful scene where... Um, you know, they're learning that they don't know what's causing HIV. They don't know what's causing AIDS. Mm -hmm. And they're, and so basically they're being told to stop having sex or to use Mm -hmm. protection because they're not quite sure. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was just a line about being queer. The one thing that we're able to do is have sex freely. Yeah. Like it was just like this idea that like taking this away from us is just so far. Yeah. And it was a mind-blowing scene because of yeah. that. Like, you never even... Having the ability... Like, because obviously STIs exist, right? Mm-hmm. But, like, there's no worse STI than children. And so, like, taking that away... <laughs> taking that away from queer people... Yeah. Saying, like, you have to use protection. You can't... Taking you need to stop me. having sex. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot. It was. I think the most... um, I, The scene in that movie that strikes me the most, and it's something that just, like, rings to me... As, as a queer person who comes from a family of heterosexuals, <laughs> um, there was this scene where he's talking to his brother, and his brother is this uh, legislator. He's, he makes, mm-hmm. you know... And at the time, the government was very much so ignoring the AIDS crisis, right? Mm-hmm. And so he's like, until you can look me in the eye and accept, stand here and accept me as your equal, your healthy equal, then I'm not going to, like, basically have any any kind of relationship with you. And it was mm-hmm. it was something that just gave me chills watching wow. that scene. Um, say, recognize me as your. I'm not sick, you know. I'm not sick because I'm gay. And and um, I, you know, there are people in my community that are here dying, and you can't sit here and accept me as your healthy human being. You know, accept me as a human being, as a person, because of one of my identifiers. And it just really like it. It really that moment brings me to tears a bit. Yeah, that's. That's mm-hmm. really more profound than the thing I said. <laughs> <laughs> it is. No, I just, that's, it's it's those moments in those films, like that moment from Love, Simon with his mom and mm-hmm. moments like that, that give you the chills. Because just as much as we want queer stories to actually represent us, we actually want to have thought-provoking moments in these movies that yeah. change our, oh, like, change our perception of our world or even because I don't necessarily need every queer movie to help me through the struggle of gay. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I just want to experience somebody else's and just be awoken by something that's so cool and profound. Yeah. And then sometimes you have movies with some levity that kind of reach the mainstream. I mean, you have, you have movies like Connie and Carla back in 2004, which was about two women that were in witness protection and ha- end up becoming uh, drag queens. They have to. It, I had Toni Collette in it. She um, mm-hmm. is an amazing actress. Um, that was probably one of the first movies I saw her in. But they there are two women that witness a crime and then they uh, end up being disguised as drag queens. Yeah, it's like mm-hmm. sister act. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, actually, I remember the funny thing is I we didn't watch a trailer for this one, but I remember this movie so specifically because the love story is so authentic to me yeah. it's goofy and it's ridiculous because there's this guy who's falling in love with this drag queen yes and it's like questioning his entire sexuality this, this yeah is, this, the problem with this is like obviously like in that whole thing of where you want somebody to accept you for who you are mm-hmm. and they're like oh see see it just matters it's just about people it's just about hearts and whatever yeah but it then turns out that the woman is like a cis woman of course yeah. and he's yeah. like oh well, no i am straight so it's fine yeah <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> so it's, fine. it's fine we need more stories that's something that we need more of though I mm-hmm. feel like that is definitely something we need more of. We need more um, queer stories where there is someone who maybe comes into, like, questioning their sexuality or, or, or has some, like, certain, you know, like, hang-ups um, with themselves and ends up yes. finding that acceptance with themselves with someone that they normally, you know, they typically would would look past and it's more of like a soul connection or, or something like that you know I feel like that's something that could really speak positively to queer stories um, yeah, it, yeah yeah I agree it, so actually talking about Hurricane Bianca it's funny that you 
uh, Hurricane Bianca is a drag queen film that came out in yes. 2016 with one of the winners of RuPaul's Drag Race. Bianca Del Rio. Bianca Del Rio. And um, as you were talking about, so the movie is her mostly as a guy presenting as male. Yeah. Uh, the whole time uh, as she's trying to figure out how to like teach these high school kids and whatever. Mm-hmm. And like, and it's just one of those things where one day she just decides to dress up in drag to try to teach them a lesson. Well, she gets fired as a guy. Oh yeah, she's That's fired. That's what it was. <laughs> she gets fired, and so she comes back as as a woman, mm-hmm. and her woman is 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 her drag persona. Yes, and I think in the movie, like she wasn't actually supposed to like really be a drag queen, uh-huh. but all her best friends were drag queens. So yeah. she just magically, gosh, Bianca, you you put a narrative out there that is so harmful to drag us. Drag is easy to do. Drag is easy. To, you can watch your two best friends do it, and girl, you can have wigs for the gods. Like, <laughs> And costumes. You happen. can go from amateur queen to woman substi- <laughs> substitute teacher. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Oh gosh, you hurt us so much with that. Oh, but gosh. no, like that movie is it. It's not the best movie by any means, but it's no. fun and it does show. It is about like finding yourself and learning how to you know work through things because at the end of the movie, obviously, she makes her job back, um, presenting uh, more masculine at work, and then. She has a nighttime, like, drag queen thing that she does and whatever. And that's how the movie kind of ends. Yeah. And and the thing is, like, as a drag queen who has to also has to operate in the corporate world, I did it. Like, I said in one of the podcast episodes that I actually decided this time around in my career I was going to come out as a drag queen very early on. Yeah. Um... And it's actually been really beneficial. A lot of my coworkers, like, buy tickets to my shows and stuff like that. And, and like, it's... That's helpful like yeah i don't feel like i'm hiding pieces of myself and then i can just still be coco in avenues and i get to still be my boy name in other avenues yeah there was one specific movie for me um as i was watching kind of like queer cinema and stuff uh that really struck me because it 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 was very it was something that really related to my situation i grew up in a household i grew up in an, i grew up pentecostal Essentially, my my uh, parents worked full time, and my grandma raised me in the Pentecostal church. And mm-hmm. then we would occasionally, like me and my parents, would go to you know church on Easter, and you know that was the extent of mm-hmm. my parents and us going to church. But for the most part, I went to church in a very fire and brimstone stony church. It was a very religious um, upbringing, and the movie Prayers for Bobby. Uh, kind of talks about what it's like to grow up in that and to feel that absolute dread. I remember praying every single night that I could be straight and that I could not have this as like something that was a part of me, you know, have this attraction to to men. And it it scared me. It scared me so much. And in the movie Prayers for Bobby, it's a, based off of a true story. It's about a guy who, a kid who is so scared and his mom is so unaccepting and unwavering in her religious beliefs that he ends up committing suicide. It talks about basically her journey as a, as a mother um, after that, and um, her journey realizing that there are contradictions in religion, and that a lot of these horrible, horrible things that we associate with queer identity and religion is um, as taken out of context, is not necessarily true, is, uh, can be seen another way, and, uh, you can find love for your kids, uh, essentially by realizing that religion has made it to where queer identity is something to be vil- villainized. Right. Mm-hmm. And, because we all had, not we all, but most of the people I know had that experience where they came out and they weren't accepted, and it and they and it pushes you to really dark thoughts because you remember those most people do come out in their formative years like Mm -hmm. in the sense of like they're still living under their parents roofs they're still in high school like they decide to come out or they get caught and then they or they get forced out i had the luxury of coming out a little bit later i came out when i was in my 20s my early 20s um it still didn't go well but um yeah but it's one of those things of where it's just uh i do want to always have this psa in here when we talk about uh coming out of the closet you don't ever feel forced to come out of the closet come out of the closet when you are ready to Mm -hmm. life does not change necessarily like your outcome doesn't change because you waited like your secrets are your secrets and your truths are your truths if you accept yourself as being queer um it doesn't necessarily matter who knows until you're ready to let them know yeah 
Um, so that movie, like, so I actually never saw Prayers for Bobby. I, so I, I remember it, but mm-hmm. like, that's just a really heavy conversation. It to is. Have. It is. And it's 2009. Sigourney Weaver is like the main star of it. I definitely recommend it. Um, or if you have, if you have, uh, homophobic religious family members <laughs> that, uh, you know, still, you know, if you still have, luckily my situation mm-hmm. with my family is something that turned around, but if you still have that, it's a good movie for them to watch. Um, and it's something that really gets those family members kind of on the same board with you and helps you understand because it does, it does result in a tragedy. The first half of the movie is about a tragedy that occurs. So, yeah. So, um, for the first part of this episode, we're going to talk about one more subject of movies, uh, before we cut it off. Yeah, one more genre. One more genre. Um, and actually to keep along the theme with, uh, Prayers for Bobby, just because I want to make you guys really sad, um, I want to talk about Boys Don't Cry. Now, I want to put a caveat there for any of the trans listeners that we have. I haven't actually seen this movie in a very long time. Same. It's been a while. So I do not know what problematic things are in that movie, Mm -hmm. but that actually was my first exposure to a trans person in a movie. Yeah. Um, That one I can say for certain. And I just remember seeing that movie and watching it in college and being... Wow, yeah, in college is the first time I saw a trans It was nineteen ninety nine when it came out. So yeah. Yeah. So which I didn't go to college in nineteen ninety nine, I went a lot later. Um, <laughs> stop trying to make me feel old. Um but, <laughs> No, seriously, this uh because at the like once again, spoiler alert, at the end of the movie, what happens to this trans man is he is violently raped by two people and um beaten and like all these like really horrible things Mm -hmm. um and it's because what happens is the movie it's actually a love story before that like he falls in love with this girl who loves him back and Mm -hmm. they start on this journey together and that's kind of what the movie's about and it was such it it made me so sad yeah because being a queer person at that time who didn't really understand transness in any capacity it was heartbreaking to see love be dismantled and taken apart so much because the very end of the movie is like so the guy's literally driving back to town after doing all these horrible things to him and then the girl like kind of is there for him he's like showers and like gets him they're gonna run away together Mm -hmm. and then literally in the next scene as he's leaving his house um i believe he's shot i think is what it is yeah i can't it's i I believe he is shot yeah i believe he's shot and killed yeah but it's it's, I mean, it's a real story, too. It's something that actually happened. Yeah, the genre we're talking about is biopics. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, it's the real-life story of Brandon Tina, and um, he's played by um, a cis act- actress. Uh, Hilary Swank plays him in the movie. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that nowadays we're starting to see more representation from people who actually fit the identities playing the roles. Yes. Um, but back then, that's what they that's what they were doing is they were having uh, cis actors fill the roles of, of trans characters in, in yes yeah uh, for a very like and still today mm-hmm. and um, still there's still today. controversy about it yeah I mean even with the Danish girl and Eddie Redmayne that's you know a recent uh, example of it yeah and then Hillary uh, sorry Halle Berry was actually slated to play a trans person in a movie. Mm-hmm. And there was a lot of backlash again for that. And, like, Mm -hmm. um, so she bowed out of that. But um, it's a really interesting topic, too, because I know, so our listeners out there, especially our cisgender listeners, Mm -hmm. uh, and cis is if identifying with the gender to which you were born with. uh, Cis people can play trans roles if trans people are given access to cis roles. To cis roles, roles. yeah. That's the problem in society right now, but Mm -hmm. they're not being given that access. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it unfair for cis people to take trans roles away when there's plenty of trans people who who can act. I mean, there's plenty of trans people in Hollywood. And there's been few examples of it happening, but there still is a lot of work to be done there. Yes. Um, We're going to get back on to the biopics that we um, recommend. Um, Some other ones that we've uh, seen. Behind the Candelabra is uh, the story of Liberace. Um, It kind of goes into his relationship with his partner, who at the time actually didn't identify as gay. Um, And this was made back in uh, 2019. Um, it's a, it's a pretty good movie. It definitely, uh, talks about, like, the, the darker side of Liberace, um, and what it was like to be closeted at that time, um, and, and what it meant for, for people who were 
partners, you know, that you, you couldn't really live out and proud. You kind of had to like live as a, like this was his assistant. His partner was his assistant and kind of houseboy that was like spoiled, but, but, um, they couldn't really have real love. And I also think if you look at the, there, there were some nuances to Liberace's character as well. Um, some other good biopics, Bohemian Rhapsody, which we've both seen. Yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody is fantastic. I, um, I did not know um, that he was queer, actually. You didn't? <laughs> I did not know. I didn't know that. I mean, I, it never came up. Like, it's... You just thought Queen was a bunch of cool, flamboyant rockers. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, because there's, like, when you have to think about, like, when Queen was, like, really famous in yeah. that regard, mm-hmm. like... Music for me, I never really cared about the individual singers per se. Yeah. Like, I didn't care about the circumstantiation or who they're dating or any of that crap. Like, I was never that person. I was never diving into who all the band's mates were and what their favorite color yeah. was and what their sign was. Like, I didn't care about any of that. Yeah. And so I never knew that. And so when the first time I knew this is actually when I watched the movie, actually. Huh. That's when it came up for me. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I was like, this seems like a gay story. And then I was like, oh, this is a gay story. (laughs) I mean, it's, it's an excellent movie. And, um, the actor that plays him in the movie. That um, plays Freddie Mercury. Yeah. That plays Freddie Mercury. Um, I can't, I forget his name right now. I do too. I'm a bad person. He's, he's amazing. Um, he's also in the show, Mr. Robot. Definitely check out Bohemian Rhapsody. It's great. Um, one that goes along with it, uh, would be Rocket Man, which was made in 2019. We both, I feel like a bad gay because we haven't seen it. Well, I was moving to Portland. Actually, <laughs> we just found out. Um, I was literally, I think I was, because I filmed Camp Wanakiki and then I moved to Portland like a week, two weeks later. Yeah. It came out in the two weeks after I got back from Camp Wanakiki to when I was moving to Portland. Yeah. So I was still living in Colorado and that's when it came out. Yeah. So it, pff. but it's the story. <laughs> <laughs> so it came out a year later and it's the story of Elton John. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, yeah, made in 2019. It's something that I definitely want to see, but keep your eyes out for some of these biopics. Um, one that we both definitely have seen that came out in the mid 2000s was Milk. And that's the story of Harvey Milk. It's the story of Harvey Milk. And it's a, they, that, that movie was actually just really interesting because they, because we all know the story of like queers and like HIV and AIDS and whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, it was interesting to see it from somebody so prominent and so loud Yes. Somebody who worked through the ranks, um, even with their queerness being one of the staples of who they were, to create all this change. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that march, I think, after he was murdered was... Yeah, after like, he was assassinated. Yeah, after he was assassinated, yeah. So, and for those of you who don't um, know exactly who Harvey Milk is, um, he was uh, the very first openly gay elected official in the history of California. Um, and he was elected to the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. Um, I think it could, I wonder who the very first openly gay elected official in all of the United States was, because I, I can't imagine there must have been many before him. (laughs) Yeah. Um, if you know the answer, because we're not going to look it up because we're tired and lazy, uh, comment below, um, either on our website or on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah. (laughs) But Milk is a really great story. I mean, it talks about that very first, um, kind of wave of, of like the, of the gay rights movement and, and what it meant for gays getting involved in politics and, and being outed. And, yeah. um, it also focuses on the religious right, like Anita Bryant going in and, yes. um, trying to disrupt the, the gay rights movement because the religious right, that's, that's the ammunition they had against us, you know? And, and nowadays that's, that's definitely scaling back a bit, but, yeah. um, it, it does talk about the power struggles between those two movements. And then now we had our first, um, front runner for you know the Democratic nomination being Pete Buttigieg. Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> <laughs> Pete Buttigieg, op- opposed to you know um, Joe Exotic, who also did run for president. Yeah. Um, who was, <laughs> who's openly gay. Yeah. Um, but I feel like Pete had more of a chance. I feel I like know. he's a little more palatable. I don't, I don't know. Just a little. <laughs> he doesn't steal and go to jail. I, I, like, <laughs> I just. I don't know. So. But the funny thing about it is, just as a side note for all of this, I think it's really interesting to have... So, obviously, this was a movie about Harvey Milk, of course. So, we don't really know what he was like, per se. But, like, having somebody that out um, with that queer of a partner... Because Pete's partner... I felt like Pete was pretty much a Republican who just happened to be gay. Yeah. Um, (laughs) But, like, with Harvey, it was so much of a different story. And it's just... Yeah. I don't feel like... 
queer people, just for anybody listening, they don't have to wear their queerness on their sleeve. Mm-hmm. But I also just don't want to see in my leadership that they feel like they might be ashamed. That they have it. to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, That's true. That's all. Yeah. you. I think queer identity is something that should be worn as a badge of honor because queer identity the reason why we have such great senses of humor is because we've been through a lot of trauma. trauma. (laughs) (laughs) And with that, um, I don't think we're going to do a feed the positive this episode because we do have a lot of ground to cover, even with the rest of the um, movies that we want to talk about in our next, uh, in part two to this episode, we will be talking about movies that we really recommend that are a little bit more independent, foreign, less mainstream, Um, and also some of the worst gay movies that we've seen as well. Yeah, I'm super excited for that. So that takes us to the end of our episode, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to me. Apparently only know about sex and movies. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you everyone for listening to this first part of our queer cinema um, edition of A Gem of a Secret. We will uh, hear from you again shortly in part two. Yeah, and make sure to t- rate us a five on Apple Podcasts. That help us out. Please a lot. do that. Yeah, we are trying to be famous. Be famous. Or maybe not famous, but just get paid for this. That'd be great. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of HM of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at The Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a J E M of a secret podcast.com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.